Hi everybody, my name is Declan Carolyn. I'm co-chair of ECR Community and general manager of ECR Ireland and I'm delighted to welcome you to our third and final ECR Community webinar in this series of the future of online category management. Today's webinar is titled Now You See It, Now You Don't, The Impact of Online Channel Availability on Consumer Behaviour and Sales. And as we all know, there are only three certainties in life, death, taxes, and product unavailability. And while the first two webinars dealt with how category management operates in an online world and how to be effective in this new space, all this effort is worth nothing if the product is unavailable to purchase. But how does the shopper react to online out of stocks? And is their reaction in any way similar to how shoppers react in a traditional retailer. This is our theme for the next 30 minutes or so. Our two speakers today are Daniel Corston, who will deliver some research output on online availability, and Tom Golden from Clavis Insight, who will illustrate how we can efficiently monitor product availability. So please enjoy the webinar, and do consider questions or comments that will deepen the conversation. And without further ado, over to you, Daniel. Thank you, Declan. Um, as you already saw, now you see it, now you don't, can also apply to the slides. But uh, besides that, I think, uh, Declan, you gave a bit of a somber view on this. If you compare online availability with death and taxes, I, I want to give it a bit of a lighter note. Obviously, it's important, but uh, it's not that important. But nevertheless, what we'll present here are some really interesting and perhaps surprising insights into the extent of outer stocks, which you probably would have imagined to be differently. We'll see how it relates to offline and, of course, the shopper reactions, because with everything in the world, if we have an outer stock, we have to see how shoppers react in order to understand what is the business implications of that. The agenda of today's webinar is um, first motivate the study and explain a little bit about the method, which also includes define and describe the term of availability to purchase because online availability is different to the on-shelf availability. There are certain things that need to be understood. We then discuss the extent of online non-availability, which is the online stockouts and its causes as far as we know. Then we will discuss how online shoppers experience non-availability to purchase because as you already gather, we do not just look at Clavis data, but we also look at survey data. And this can help us explain some of the shoppers switching behavior and explain some of the effects of the switching on retailers and brands. And then we'll end up with Tom explaining some of the uh, ideas and, and the power of an analytics program to monitor online channel availability. Good. So, 2002, some of you may remember, probably most of you not. As a matter of fact, if all of you would remember, we'd probably have a fairly old uh, audience today. Now, in 2002, we started some research on out of stocks in supermarket shelves. It was a study that was published by the Grocery Manufacturers of America. We surveyed 48 retailers and studies across the globe. We looked at Asia, we looked at Europe and the United States, and one of the key results of the study was that the supermarket shelf out of stock level was an average across the world and across um, about 10 categories in supermarkets around 8.3 percent. We also established that most of the problems of out of stocks were with the retailers, you know, forecasting, replenishment in store, ideas like that. And we also established how shoppers would react if a product was out of stock. 15 years later, the world has changed. We are in a world where digital is the norm. Most of the people actually are omni-channel shoppers. And so digital enables pretty much all shopping today. And so we realized that we had to extend our previous study on outer stocks into the new online world. And we wondered how common are outer stocks online and how do shoppers react to outer stocks and how does the shopper behavior impact brands and retailers, and what is the impact on sales? In a nutshell, we found a sponsor, and I can already tell you now that 
The sponsor is again Grocery Manufacturers of America and a major FMCG company. And we researched 13,000 online shoppers across the world. We looked at all major retailers and we looked at 273 days, which was the first three quarters of 2016 in six countries. So quite an effort on our side to make sure that the results that we have are interesting for people around the world. Now, the countries that we looked at obviously feature also three important European countries, which is Germany, the UK, France. But we also looked at Asia. We looked at Japan, China, and we looked, of course, at the United States of America. Today we will present the aggregate of all of this because we do not have time to go into details, but the report that we will eventually publish, of course, will go into details for all of these countries. Now, you would probably like to know which categories we covered. Now, the categories we covered are seen here. It is baby care, fabric care, oral care, shave care, skin care, hair care, and it is clear that the sponsor of the study is active in these categories. So, what are our findings? And how, how did we go about to get to these findings? We looked at four different studies that all together gave us these insights. Study number one, where we were relying on the capabilities of Clavis Insights, helped us to understand the extent of outer stocks. We extracted category level data for the first three quarters of 2016 and we realized 12 million data points in order to get some robust estimates. Study number two looked at shopper survey in the United States. We collected data in 2016 from panelists who had purchased the target category online. We received 8,100 85 qualified responses in the United States. So we have a pretty good sample here. We also looked at the other five countries as to the survey data. We worked with a global data provider and we conducted the survey in the UK, Germany, France, Japan, and China. We collected data again around the same time in 2016. And we have about 1,000 respondents per country for a total of 5,000, which again gives us a fairly solid view on the shopper reactions. And we were able to do a few deep dives as well. Now, what does it actually mean available to purchase online? What's the difference to on-shelf availability? Now, the difference is, is that we now live in an omni-channel world. So what does that mean? An item we consider to be available to purchase at a retailer if it is shown to be in stock at the retailer. In other words, the shopper goes and sees the product and can actually purchase it. But if you think about Amazon or Walmart, they obviously also offer the possibility that if a product is stocked out with a brand, that there are resellers on the marketplace. So from the brand's point of view, if a product is out of stock at the brand but can be purchased on the retailer's marketplace, it is also available to purchase. And the third option is if you think about click and collect, then if the product is not available online, but for instance, a Walmart.com suggests that it is available at a store near you, so you can click, buy, and collect the product there. That's also available to purchase because all of these three elements here are clickable purchase that are either delivered home or picked up at the store. Straightforward. However, is it not? Because it is a few more things we know from the offline world. An item is not available to purchase if it is shown to be out of stock on the product page. Now, this means that if I am the shopper and I go to my product page, there is an indication usually in writing that says product is unavailable, stocked out. Sometimes it tells us when it will be available again, but at the point that I actually want to buy it, it is not available. There may be retailers who allow you to, you know, uh, back log the product, clicking on it, and you receive it later. But within the fast-moving consumer goods area, this is rather unusual. And the second thing that's perhaps a little new, although there is an analogy to the offline world, is the term void. Because many retailers choose, for instance, to suppress a product page if the product is not available, which means that you as a shopper, you cannot access the product page. 
So in other words, you might be looking for a specific product. You might have even written down the product code, but you cannot get to the product page because the product page has been made inaccessible. And there's a few other reasons for this. We'll talk about that later. By the way, as you see, void is something that also exists in the offline world. Imagine this would be the equivalent to a product that is listed at a retailer, but it isn't even shown at the retailer. So in the sh on the shelf, there isn't even a space allocated for the product and you cannot see the price tag that would indicate that a product should be there. So those are the things that matter in this particular situation. And this is how we define available to purchase. Now, what is the extent of available to purchase? And what are some of the causes if the product is not available? Remember what I said early on in the seminar about the offline world where we 15 years ago established that the extent of out of stocks is 8.3%. Well, hold that number in your mind and wait what we get now. Our research finds that the level of available to purchase is 80%. This, as you saw, was in stock, marketplace, and available in an offline store. But what is probably more shocking is that the extent of unavailable to purchase is 20%. That number is staggeringly high, and obviously there are reasons why this is so high. And one of the reasons is that when we think of the online world, we, had, um, we have the two specific elements of not available, which is on the one side, out of stocks, where the product page indicates that the product is unavailable for purchase and the voids. Now, the first observation is that the level of out of stocks with 8.1% online is strikingly similar to the level of out of stocks offline, which, as I said before, was 8.3 when we measured it a couple of years ago. What adds to this is obviously the void portion, which is even higher than the out of stock version. Void, as I said, is when the product page is inaccessible. So the total of 20% is that voids add to out of stocks. Now, honestly, and this is something that we realized while we were doing the research, when we wrote the study in 2002 about offline out of stocks, we didn't know how many voids we should have added to the out of stocks, but definitely we see that voids are a massive problem in the digital world and this needs to be addressed. Now, the next question is obviously, what is the situation in different countries? Now, on the left side of this chart, you see the world average as we discussed it before. Now, if we look at the six bars which indicate China, France, Germany, Japan, UK, and US, we see three different groups of countries. On the one side, on the left hand, we see China. China strikes everybody as a country that has problems with availability, perhaps because of its unique supply chain structure. But with 18.7%, the out of stock rate is very high and clearly much higher than anywhere else. Voids are 12%. That is probably within the expectations. Now, the other country that strikes everybody as a little bit uh, exceptional is France. France has a very low level of out of stocks with 0.8% and a very high level of voids. Now, as I was pointing out before, whether or not a product is unavailable or void is to some degree within the discretion of the retailer. A retailer can, for instance, choose to suppress the product page of a product that is stocked out and thereby making a product that should be indicated to the consumer as unavailable a void. And there could be reasons for this. For instance, a reason a retailer might feel that showing too many out of stocks is detrimental to the retailer's image, and so he chooses to void it. Now, we don't know the motivation of all of these retailers, but we feel that in France, clearly the voids are overrepresented vis-a-vis -vis the outer stocks. Because if we look at the other countries, for instance, Germany, UK, and the United States, we see that in these countries, which have particularly the UK and the US, 
a similar level of maturity for online retail, we see that the outer stocks hover around 4%, the voids hover around 10%, and there seems to be some element of stability in these numbers. So in other words, we feel there is definitely room for China to improve its availability by dramatically reducing their outer stocks. And we feel that probably France has a level of stockouts that is more comparable with US, UK and Germany. Nevertheless, we see, for instance, by looking at Japan, that there is a way to reduce the level of outer stocks to 2%. So in other words, the situation as it is right now is not satisfactory and brands should work with retailers in order to improve this. Now, we were discussing quickly before, what are some of the causes of the lack of availability? Obviously, out of stocks can be caused by product supply problems, disruptions of the supply chain, lack of product uh, factories or warehouses that do not have enough stock or capacity to produce enough. But clearly demand management in the online world is a challenge. Demand forecasts tend to be very difficult in the offline world and in the online world where things move faster than in the offline world, it's even harder to do proper forecasting. So clearly this is a reason for our Now on the void side, what is interesting here is that we are not looking at inventory problems, we're looking at process issues, we're looking at process failures. For instance, product transition, products that are introduced, and there are obviously many products that are introduced, into the online retailers um, websites and if these product transitions do not are not smoothly executed perhaps there's some digital asset that is missing or there is issues regarding the product description or whatnot then obviously the retailer may not show that website and this also counts as a void or alternatively we can have the problem that the retailer has actually delisted the product and sort of suppressed the product but the re uh, but the brand hasn't followed up on that and then finally master data and content can be big issues. We know how effortsome it is to prepare a listing for a product at a retailer and how many problems regarding master data can lead to a delay or problems to actually make that product shelf ready. Now, but how does it all influence the shoppers? Because a product that is not available, but that is low in demand, is obviously less impactful than a product that is not available, but that is high in demand. And equally, perhaps shoppers are more brand loyal, perhaps shoppers are more store loyal. So what is the situation online? First thing that we try to find out is we try to compare the data from Clavis with the shopper survey data. So we asked the shoppers of whom we know that they had already purchased in the specific category, whether they had experienced an um, out of stock online and how did they experience this? And it turned out that 45% said that they really experienced an out of stock that said it was an out of stock. There were some said that the product was not delayed 20%. And there were four or 5% who said that there were other reasons or that the availability to promise was only at the store. What's interesting is that many shoppers experience a delay, a delay in delivery as a product that is not available. This is something that we didn't consider, but from a perceptional point of view of the shopper, if a product is delayed in delivery to many, this is the same as if it was not there. And we'll get to that point later on because there's clearly a generational issue as to the patience that people have with regards to waiting. Now, which shoppers experience non-availability promise and how does it impact them? This is information from the United States. Now, the first couple of bars show us the difference in age. And we clearly see that young digital natives between the age of 18 to 25 experience higher levels of non-availability to purchase than older people. Now, I have children and I teach and I regularly ask my students who are all in that age bracket how patient they are in terms of waiting online for products or general their willingness to wait. And it turns out it is true. 
currently the younger generation is not willing to wait. So what we assume is that those people who are younger, when they go online and they don't find what they're looking for, they quickly abandon the search and just declare the search as ended and that the product is not available. Whereas older people have either better search experience, search algorithms, search heuristics, or are perhaps more patient. But nevertheless, given the fact that many brands are currently targeting the um, digital natives, we see that this could be a problem. Now, on the other side, we didn't find too many differences between male and female shoppers, but we did find differences among the ethnicity. Now, we found that white Caucasian people in the United States mention fewer problems finding their problems that they're looking for than other races. Now, we did a little bit of digging into this because we were surprised by this finding. And we assume that this has something to do with the choice and the availability of products that are specific to certain ethnicities. So in other words, we find that retailers might have to review their assortment and their search items and their search algorithms in order to account for this. Now, how does all of that compare to uh, the responses that shoppers have? And as we were indicating before, shoppers can react by substituting the brand variant. They can also substitute to a different brand, for instance, um, you know, competitive brand. They can also switch to the online store. They can. So I'm having some issues here with the. Sorry. Okay. They can switch the to a physical store. They can do not. They can choose to delay or cancel the purchase, and all of these options have an influence. Now, the next chart is a little bit more busy because we're looking at the differences in uh, across the whole world. So what we see here is, again, we have on the right side, we have the global average, and then we have the same situation across for each of these countries. Now, the first thing that we realize is that in the United States, we have less store switching. The 15% on the left-hand side indicate that only 15% of the US shopper we surveyed switched the store when they are confronted with an outer stock. Now, compare this with China, where we see that 34% of the shoppers are willing to switch store if they are confronted with an outer stock. Now, there are many reasons for this, why this could be, and it probably warrants more research. But our first suggestion is that in China, shoppers are more brand loyal, perhaps because they are still in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a world where brands have a little bit more um, influence on their purchasing behavior than in the United States. The second point that we realize is that in the United States, our sample is very much skewed to Amazon shoppers. And if we think about Amazon Prime, clearly this arrangement, Amazon Prime, has increased the switching barriers for shoppers. In other words, when you're on Amazon and you don't find what you're looking for, but you receive free shipping, you're more inclined to stay with an Amazon and choose a different brand or a different brand variant. Because if you look at UK, France and Germany, three European countries with more or less similar levels of maturity and online, you don't see this pattern as much as we see it in the United States and China. Nevertheless, overall, you can see that the difference between that there are certain brands that are more online that lead to more brand switching and others that lead to more store switching. Now, how does this now matter and how can we draw some conclusions and comparisons as to the bricks and mortar retail? If we compare our study now with our study a few years ago, you see that today in online retail, we see far less store switching, particularly in the United States, because that's the data that we're looking at right now. However, we see far more brand switching in online stores in the United States. When it comes to how the same store switching or the variant is more or less the same. When we did our study in 2002, there was not the possibility of switching between online and offline. So the switch channel option is now 9% and before it didn't exist. However, when we look at the delay or cancel option, we see that nowadays people switch a little bit less because in the online world offers them more choice so they do not have to delay or cancel their decision. 
but the clearly the clear difference is here that we see a switch between store switching and brand switching and this is something that brands have to investigate now again we made a point here that this could be because of the specific arrangement that amazon has with prime however it is something to consider for brands if they want to make sure that when an out of stock happens they do not lose that shopper so what other factors influence the uh, online, the, uh, the switching behavior? Now, there is obviously what we already discussed, the country effect. Amazon in the United States is a specific Amazon Prime effect. It could also be that the structure of retail in general influences this. There is a category effect, as we also found in the offline world. The more involvement a category has, the more involvement a product has, the more likely we are going to stay with the product. In other words, we are more brand loyal than store loyal. There is also a question regarding the way we encounter unavailability. If the product is out of stock, it says that it is out of stock on the product page. We are more likely to switch item in the store. If it is void, we're more likely to switch store. We also have some basket and timing effects. There is a clear effect of the number of items in the shopping trip. If we are early in a shopping trip, we are more likely to switch. If we are late in a shopping trip, we are less like we are less likely to switch retailer. We're more likely to switch brand. There are psychological cost effects because research has shown that shoppers make their decisions by taking into consideration transaction substitution opportunity costs. And we do also find uh, different types of shoppers. We find a hardcore online shopper and we find multi-channel shoppers. And the multi-channel shoppers are clearly more willing to switch between channels, whereas the hardcore online shopper will more likely stay within the retailer and change with brands or brand variants. And then there are the demographic effects that we already discussed, differences between digital natives, digital immigrants, gender, race, and ethnicity. So all of these things have to be taken into consideration and shopper inside people in today's audience will probably be delighted to see that there's more work to be done and more research to be executed. Now, what does it all mean in terms of the impact on retailers and brands? Now, simply speaking, retailers lose sales when shoppers switch online store, switch offline store, or switch intention, which means they delay or cancel the purchase. The brands lose sales when shoppers switch brand and when they delay or cancel the purchase, but the shoppers always lose because what we do not see here is that there is a long term effect on the store and brand equity because shoppers are actually seeking convenience online and out of stocks disrupt their intention to achieve convenience online. But in terms of the actual shopper transaction loss, we are currently in the process of developing a little tool that details the loss in dollars compared to the sales that you have online. Now, obviously, the more data we have, particularly if we have demand data, the more nuanced we can make these estimations. But in a very simple rule of thumb, if you assume, as we showed early on, that 20% of the products are not available, that's already striking. But what if you understand that what we measure is actually skewed days, you will realize that a non-availability of 20% means that the products were not available 20% of the time. Now, if you take, let's say, a year with 12 months, then simply speaking, and 360 days, you can say that if you are a brand and you made something like 100 million in sales, that 100 million in sales was not made in 360 days, it was made in 300 days. In other words, if your products would have been available all day, if your voids would have been at zero, you would have been able to sell perhaps 20% more. And these are obviously striking numbers. Now, to finish off, we are still looking for partners where our, for our for extension of our research. At this point in time, we've looked at non-food categories, but not all interesting non-food categories. We're particularly interested in extending our research into food categories. And the participants will receive category-specific insights on extend, shopper reactions on the brand and the retail loss, obviously many other areas that we haven't been able to share with you today, and of course, into the root causes. And we will be very happy to work with those who are interested to develop the business case and help you increase the online availability. 
we're ready to start anytime, so please send us an email after this webinar. With this, I want to hand over to Tom, who is going to talk a little bit about how you as a brand can create an availability and analytics program to improve availability and gain important insights. Thank you, Daniel. Um, that was very interesting. Uh, some really uh, clear and interesting insights into the impact of uh, lack of availability or uh, lack of availability, availability to purchase in the online channel. So in, in the few minutes left here, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what the considerations are for if you want to set up a program to monitor your online channel uh, availability so that basically you can do something about uh, this uh, significant problem. Um, I guess one of the great things about uh, the online channel is that we have a lot more options in terms of what we can measure, uh, when we can measure it. It's, it's uh, you know, the, the fact that the information is available, available in a digital context, uh, it enables us to measure a lot more than might be possible in, in the offline world. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit about that. And, um, <clears throat> one of the things, I guess, a couple of things we need to consider, uh, there's a few uh, key differences between the online and offline channel, and um, Daniel spoke to, to, uh, to many of the differences, but one of the, the differences that uh, makes a huge impact on the uh, out-of-stock levels, we think, uh, at Clavis anyway, uh, is the, the change from push to pull uh, in terms of inventory replenishment. I mean, as, as Daniel pointed out, there, there seems to be a bigger problem with out-of-stocks in the uh, online world than there is in the offline world. And one of the reasons for this is the way that uh, retailers and manufacturers interact uh, and how they, uh, the orders go from one to the other. In the traditional world, we're used to uh, a method or a, 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 where the manufacturer um, will sell as much product as he possibly can to, to the retailer. The retailer will stack them on the shelf, stack them high, and let them stack them high and let them fly scenario. Uh, and the consumers will be in the store, and the, you know the products will be pushed to them through you know, displays and promotions, etc. In um, in a um, online context, it works slightly differently. A lot more of the onus is on the manufacturer to generate demand from consumers through uh, making sure that their products are set up properly and with uh, the right levels of detail in the online store so that consumers can find them through search and various other methods, uh, order them online, and then that in turn will drive demand from the retailer to the manufacturer. Uh, and, and for this reason, a lot of online manufacturers hold uh, less inventory than, than traditional brick and mortar retailers, so the risk of going out of stock is probably higher there because of that. And as you know, Daniel pointed out, you know, the, the, out of stock, the risk of going out of stock loses to, you know, leads to lost sales, uh, and you know, consumer loyalty is tested and can, can uh, uh, help uh, deliver problems to your brand on a wider scale. But one of the key things that, that also happens in online channel that um, is hugely important is the uh, lack of availability has a, a massive negative impact on your search rank. And search rank is one of the key uh, routes for consumers to find your product in the online channel. So therefore, you know it's your key uh, journey to journey to a sale. Um, it, this uh, chart here shows uh, tracks the uh, online availability uh, versus search rank for a product. The U.S. example uh, we tracked over, uh, but it still applies in in other uh, markets. We tracked this product over a three-week period, start of September, and you know, looking at the first three days there in the chart, you can see that the product is at sort of mid-30s. Uh, it, it's available to purchase and it, it is a re reaching mid-30s, mid to late 30s levels in terms of uh, search rank in this particular store that we tested it in. Now that's still not a, that's not a great search rank to be honest. You need to be on your on the first page of search to be started really generating decent sale levels. But when this product went out of stock, then on the um, third, fourth, sorry, of September, 
uh, you can see its search rank drop down even further, right down to 76, and even further on the next day when it wasn't, when it was available to purchase, but it was only available in the marketplace on this store. Uh, and then over a period of time, it took some time to build back up to its original uh, search rank uh, through being in stock for a number of days, and then eventually drops back down again to you know, over 100, which is basically equivalent to being at the bottom of a shelf, bottom, bottom shelf, at the back of a bottom of shelf, basically, in, in, a, in a physical store. You know, nobody's going to find you down there, and nobody's going to buy your product. So, you know, the, there is a, a huge correlation between your search rank and sales loss. So we, uh, we studied the top 50 selling SKUs uh, in this category uh, across a number of stores, in, again, in the U.S., and we figured out that the, the, our study showed that a drop from position 5 in search to position 15 would uh, result in a 40% loss in sales, which is massive. Availability itself uh, also led to a 10% loss in sales per SKU per day that the product is out of stock. And these two together, search and availability, um, generated you know, a, a greater loss than all the other sort of key performance indicators uh, that Clavis measures, uh, also measures uh, put together. So pr promotions, ratings and reviews, content integrity, all had an impact on, on, on sales, but uh, not, not to the extent of search and availability. And as we showed earlier, you know, availability has an impact on search, so it's, it's kind of a vicious circle here. Uh, so you want to avoid this, and one of the starting points to avoiding it is figuring out the depth of the problem. Uh, and in, by do, in doing that, you know, to measure your online availability across uh, your, your key online retailers. Uh, and as I said, you know, the great thing about the online channel is we can do this uh, with, uh, you know, with, with fairly accurate execution. Um, one of the things you've got to think about, though, the key consideration, I guess, when you're setting up your online availability measurement is to really understand the, the type of stores, or understand what you're measuring, the type of stores. So if you think about it in terms of the e-commerce model that you're dealing with, so for example, whether it's a click and collect model that the stores you're dealing with, or whether it's a um, home delivery model, you want to be measuring something slightly different. So drive or click and collect, which is huge in France, where the consumer orders online and picks up at, at a at store, specific store location. Um, in this case, you need to be measuring the online availability and the distribution, which would differ from store to store in a region. So it's kind of like a, in football parlance, like a man marking uh, scenario that you want to be thinking about, so measuring the online availability, availability in each of these individual stores in, in your key catchment area. Whereas <clears throat> if you're doing home delivery, if you're measuring a home delivery scenario, it's more of a zone marking type scenario um, where the shopper fulfillment generally comes from a, a distribution center or a dark store somewhere which would um, deliver to a much wider area. So you, can, uh, you need to measure the distribution and availability in these various zones or in these various regions um, at, on, on a case-by-case -case basis and be able to compare one with the other and see where the problems are and see what, uh, see what you can do to, to uh, solve that problem in terms of making sure the delivery uh, or the availability is, is higher than you know, getting to Japanese levels of where, where your out of stock is only down to sort of 2%. So I'm afraid we're running out of time. So very quickly, just to kind of recap on that, I guess that the key to, to managing and measuring first, first, I guess, to manage your availability, you need to measure and find out what it is first. Uh, and then start dealing with the problems. But I guess the key to measuring it first is under, really understanding uh, what type of stores you're measuring, where the stores are, how they deal with out of stocks. Daniel talked about it earlier in terms of, you know, some stores will uh, post, will will keep the, the product page up live uh, and post the fact on the product page that is out of stock, whereas others will uh, make the, the page disappear effectively so the consumer can't find it. So when the consumer searches for your product, it won't find it in the store altogether. Uh, so understanding that is key to, to helping you measure uh, your, your in-stock availability, whether it's a void or out-of-stock. 
Uh, and then the other thing is, you know, just do it start, once you get started, to start doing it on a regular basis and, you know, pick the geographies that you need to uh, measure it in. Um, and, you know, it's not something that you're going to fix in a short period of time. So the sooner you get going on measuring it uh, and understanding it, you can start really putting the solution to fix it. <clears throat> I'll leave it at that because, as I say, we're running out of time uh, and to leave some time for questions and answers. Paul, if you want to um, take from there and uh, go to some of the Q&A part. Absolutely. Thank you, Tom uh, and Daniel, uh, for your wonderful insights. Really, uh, as Tom had mentioned earlier, really some uh, actual, uh, actual tips and, um, that we have here. First question here, kind of, um, Tom, actually, I think we use pretty well for your, for your section. Um, how many individual stores should we think about monitoring to get a good understanding of uh, market level online channel availability? Yeah, that's, a, that's a, an interesting question and, and obviously it's going to depend on the market you're in, it's going to depend on the category you're in, it's going to depend a lot on, um, you know, what, what you're trying to measure. But I guess the key to it is really that what I was talking about there earlier is getting an understanding of the type of stores you're trying to monitor. So if it's, if it's drive uh, and click and collect, you probably have to monitor a lot more stores to get a, a good understanding of your market level or average availability. And, and you know where the where the gaps are, where the holes are. If it's uh, the home delivery scenario that you're you're looking at, you probably get away with measuring uh, far fewer stores or far fewer locations. Uh, however, you know you still need to be measuring it across the, your market and across different retailers uh, to give you a good uh, market level understanding. Great. So I assume. Um, you know, kind of piggybacking on that. So, what are some what are some of the tactics and tools that um, you've seen manufacturers use to, to help uh, you know track this? Uh, well, obviously, we see lots of people using uh, Clavis Insights, uh, <laughs> location-based analytics tool. Uh, you know, we're, we're working with a number of customers around Europe and the U.S. and in Asia as well, uh, and helping them get a, get a clear understanding of their um, product level availability and, and all the other metrics on a store-by-store -store basis uh, with our location-based analytics uh, extension to the, the Cloud of Inside Analytics uh, solution. Great, perfect. And then, uh, Daniel, this one looks like it's for you. Um, are you looking for large manufacturers only to participate in the, uh, the GMA study or uh, would a smaller su uh, supplier still benefit from, from participating? So, first of all, um, I just want to clarify, this is a study, although the comp although the sponsor is the grocery manufacturers of America, it will be a global study. So this is a European audience. So a lot of people will say, like, why should I be interested in a study that it will eventually, um, you know, that is perhaps a US study? No, no, we're talking about a global study where we're looking at participants in all potential countries of this world. And we're not just looking for all potential countries, but we're also looking for different sizes. So in that sense, please, anybody who's interested, please send me an email and we can figure out what is the best setting for you. And the other thing that I wanted to say is what's really important is to start early with trying to root out, root out <clears throat> the root causes. That's something that's really fundamental. It takes time to figure this out. It's an effort that requires internally working together between sales and supply chain. I know a lot of people online are actually from Consumer Insights, from Shopper Insights, from Key Account, from e-commerce, and there's some people from supply chain as well. And there's really a need for you guys to work together. And there's a need for you guys to work together with the retailers. So you have to go out, work with the retailers, do the workshop in order to find out what are the root causes and root these causes out for good. I think that's really important. Don't run away, don't just rush ahead if you haven't solved the problem. And we're really happy to help you. So just send us an email and we can set something up. Thank you. Great. And then a uh, final question here um, for Declan. Um, so, it, you know, very good compliment on, on the series. This person, uh, the webinar series, very useful and impactful for their day-to-day -day job. Uh, do you think um, the program will be extending or the webinar series uh, will be extending into the new year? Thanks, Paul. Our, our initial uh, view was to trial a series of three webinars um, to, to sense content, to sense check the uh, usability of webinars, 
and also to, to check with participants in terms of the value and the format that has been delivered. So having conducted the first the three webinars, um, my feeling uh, before, before I really research the answer with stakeholders, that has been very favorable. I think the format works for ECR in terms of facilitating experts and facilitating members of ECR and, and associates um, for joining perhaps a quarterly update and tracking the development of online retailing and would allow us to do deep dives into the various processes associated with it. So we have an ECR quarterly meeting um, next month in Prague. We will make a decision uh, and view the feedback from stakeholders and participants in advance of that. Um, my, my, my feeling is that we will continue them in 2018. At this juncture though, Paul, I would like to extend my thanks to Tom and the team at Clavis Insight and to Daniel Corston for supporting our first three webinars. Um, I'd like to acknowledge and applaud the level of content uh, and certainly I feel as though we've tracked a number of disciplines and processes uh, involved with online retailing um, and look forward uh, in the new year perhaps setting up a, another series of, of uh, webinars accordingly.